I've got a degree in physics from UC Berkeley, and I've had a lifelong fascination with the true nature of reality. And I actually believe that's probably what propelled me to have some of the experiences that I had, which demonstrated that there are sometimes these remarkable shifts in reality that can occur. And that what we call quantum jumps are not just something that happens on the quantum so-called scale, but they can happen at any level of physical reality. I had a fairly normal stretch of time in my life when I was doing normal research. I had a job in the banking industry. When things started changing was around 1994 when I started really noticing remarkable changes in reality that was following a kundalini awakening, which was a change in my inner energy. It seemed like just being flooded with so much energy that it was incredible. And sometimes seeing so much light, I felt blinded even with my eyes shut. There was so much light around me during it. And then also after, I was noticing that I'd sometimes be spontaneously aware of things happening in remote locations, like spontaneous rem remote viewing or 360 degree vision that I can see all the way around me at quite, quite a distance and outside the walls of the house. So it was really startling. And then ever since then, I've had the ability at times to have exactly the same experience again. I didn't test it so much by doing those kinds of things of uh, going to see if what I saw was real, but my daughters would try to sneak up on me and they never could, especially after that. It was just impossible because I could, I could see them before they got to me. <laughs> I've had other things happen where if I'm daydreaming, I've been observed in two locations. I know I'm in one place where I'm daydreaming, but I'm observed somewhere else. So there's a bilocation that can occur. I'll give you an example of one morning when my daughters were quite young, I, I needed to go wake them up each morning so they'd go to school. So I'd, And they were too small to open the curtain in their room. It was too heavy. So I would go down the hall, open, well, I'd turn the light on, and then I'd walk to the window and they'd say, good morning, girls, and I'd open this very heavy curtain that would then go up. And one morning, it was a cold morning, I didn't want to get out of bed right away, and I was still thinking about dreams and daydreaming a little bit. And in my mind, I was daydreaming that I walked down the hall, turned on the light, said, good morning, girls, open the curtain. I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if it was that easy? But then I hear noises from their room, and then they come running around the house, and they're like, mom, mom, where are you? And then, mom, what are you doing back in bed? <laughs> I never got out of bed. <laughs> and I said, what? What do you mean? You just saw me? And they said, yes. I said, where was I? And they said, in our room. And I, I, that, now I'm jumping out of bed and I'm running to go see what happened. And their light is on. The, the window curtain is open. And nobody else could have done that. It, would, it only could have been me. And I know I didn't. So I, was, I experienced that I'm in bed. They experienced I was there. So that was what a bilocation felt like. And for me, daydreaming and just sort of wishing I was there. The other time it happened, I was daydreaming and wishing I was somewhere and someone saw me there. So I've done this twice. Uh, so, And it, it feels great. It's just feeling like, ah, oh, I wish I could be there. And then guess what? Maybe you are. So after this experience happened, I immediately looked up to see what could explain these kind of experiences. And I found out that throughout history, uh, people have had these kinds of experiences. It's really quite normal, and it's something that is considered um, often something that's typical for a shaman or someone who is the healer for a community because people who have that much energy can help to be a conduit for changes in reality. And so that really got my attention about how you can change reality or how all of us do that. For me, the, the most interesting thing that, that I learned about physics was quantum physics at UC Berkeley. I loved my classes uh, in that subject matter. And I, after my kundalini awakening, I came to realize that a lot of the answer to what is the nature of reality seems to be held in the mysteries of quantum physics, which although we can work out the mathematics and we can solve equations and we can even build atomic bombs and nuclear power plants, we don't exactly think the way 
quantum physics um, shows us that the world really operates. And what's so wonderful and mysterious about the quantum physics and quantum mechanics is that when we look to see what are these building blocks of matter, we find that at the very center of um, the very smallest inseparable indivisible particle, which would be like an electron, if you can't get any smaller than that, then that qualifies as a quantum particle. Those little electrons can actually be observed to be in one place and then they, it's like they vanish. Um, they can change an energy level and show up instantly somewhere else. And they do other things also. They can be connected with one another, entangled, and when one is affected and its spin is up and the other one's spin is down, um, if you observe one, as soon as you make an observation on one that's entangled with another, they both flip at the same time. These entanglements are now being tested in laboratory conditions around the world as people are building quantum computers. There's been a race, like a gold rush, to, to see how fast we can find this information and these new technologies. So diamonds and large things that you can observe in your hands are being entangled. They're showing entanglements that are holding together at greater and greater distances. So we can tell, obviously, throughout the universe there can be an entanglement with one particle right here and another particle in an entirely different galaxy great distances away. So there seems to be no limitation on the distance. When we look at space and time, then we start recognizing that humans have a unique experience with space and time. And what we think is true for everything may not be true for everything, but may more be a facet of our humanity and the way that we are set up to observe reality. The Mandela Effect is a term that was coined in the year 2010 by a blogger, Fiona Broom. And she and a bunch of people noticed that they remembered that the gentleman named Nelson Mandela from South Africa had died before 2010. They were all surprised and glad that he was alive, but really surprised because they remembered clearly that he had previously died. So this was the first time that the idea of a whole bunch of people remembering something differently really um, caught hold and it became very popular on Reddit, the, that website, as well as the Mandela Effect website that Fiona Broom started. And actually, this is a phenomenon that I've been tracking since the 1990s. It's what I would call reality shift. And that was a term that was coined by PMH Atwater when she wrote an earlier book that I didn't know about at the time. So I, I found that the word reality shift seemed to explain that there are a bunch of people that notice someone died and now they're alive again. I noticed Larry Hagman and I wrote about him in my book Reality Shifts. He's an actor from the TV show Dallas. So I described that um, lots of people noticed he had died and then he was alive again. It's a phenomenon that's very interesting because the closer you are to uh, Larry Hagman or Nelson Mandela, the less likely you are to notice that particular individual had died and then they come alive again. It's more likely to happen when it's someone that you don't see very often. You don't really think about them much. They're on the periphery of your awareness. They're not the focal point. They're off to the side. So you know about them and then when you hear about it, it's like, wow, that's big. So that was the beginning of this Mandela effect. It has now exploded in terms of lots of other examples, books, movies, you name it, products, <laughs> all kinds of things. So when it comes to things like we notice products changing, that can be confusing uh, because, of course, first you want to make sure, was it really some kind of a change? Did the company make a change? Once you eliminate that possibility, then the only thing left is um, that when, when it's, you're the one that noticed the change, um, unless you think you're going crazy or getting forgetful. Usually this is not the case. Usually people that notice these things are very observant. They're getting an opportunity to experience these alternate histories. And what's happening is one group of people would notice it, like with Nelson Mandela, the ones who don't live in South Africa, like myself and others, they remember he died when he was in, incarcerated. He was still in jail and it seemed such a tragedy. It just seemed, it seemed very sad. And then there was a, a big um, hullabaloo. There were lots of uh, things going on with his widow and the government and trying to work things out with the estate. Anyway, 
it's not confabulation, which is what some people say the Mandela effect is. They say, well, you're just making this up. But why would so many people make that up? As far as how it works, I don't know. And so I'm not going to just say like, oh, I've got a theory that explains everything. I, instead, I'm, look, I'm more like a biologist back when biologists would travel the world to, to see if they could categorize what kind of birds and animals they're observing. Just like when Charles Darwin is on the Beagle, that, that ship, and he's traveling across the world. That's what I've been doing with these reality shift examples. So I'm still gathering information, but it's possible that what we're looking at is something that's similar to a holographic multiverse. So there's a, there's a holographic component where everything is connected and it's one, like the pages in a book. Um, but there are all these, each page might s signify another parallel reality, which could be side by side by side. And sometimes you can jump from one page to another. Where everybody else is, that gets to the question of consciousness. And how can each of us hold ideas that might be from some other reality, then we need to start taking a look at what some people might call are these anomalous experiences. But to me, I think they're pretty common experiences. And I think we're seeing more evidence of this sort of quantum behavior in all of biology, in all of life. There are an infinity of possibilities that at every moment we make a choice, we're looking at that and feeling that. And so people who've had near-death experiences, or are lucid dreamers, or have had a kundalini experience, they're much more keenly aware of this process, and they can, they can feel when they're in it. And it's, it's pretty remarkable, because you can tell that there's a reality that's always been there. It's not so much that you're creating it or calling it to you. It's more that you are recognizing that the, the truth of who you are is consciousness, and as consciousness, you're capable of making that jump into any reality, which sounds incredible. But people who've come back from being dead will sometimes report that's exactly what they did. And that's how they were able to become fully healed when they were extremely sick before. Actually, most of us do experience these quantum jumps, and we don't think much of it when it happens. Sometimes we are just happy that it happens. And I'm thinking right now of the example where if you need to wake up and you have trouble waking up and you will yourself to get out of bed on a cold morning, that willpower, that moment, uh, is an example of it. That doesn't sound very impressive, I know. And then one that's a little bit more impressive, but still not that impressive, so it's easy. These are little baby step quantum jumps. <laughs> Another good one that's easy to do is if you're starting to catch a cold and you can tell yourself, I can't get sick today. And I think we've all had that experience where it's like, no, this is not happening. I have to stay well today. And then you notice, after I thought that, I felt fine. A lot of people have that experience. And then one that's scientifically proven in the laboratories right now, it's where you know for sure that you did not get a good night's sleep. Maybe there was a neighbor fighting or lots of noise, traffic accidents, something going on that was so noisy there's no way you got a good night's sleep. It was the worst night's sleep ever. In the morning, all you need to do is keep telling yourself over and over and over again until you start believing it. I had a wonderful night's sleep last night. And you just keep repeating that, just starting to believe it, convince yourself. Then what's scientifically proven is that you will behave on all sorts of cognitive tests, physical tests, just the same as if you'd had that good night's sleep. And you'll feel better. So these are things that are easy. On the other extreme, you know, because these I, I like to look at the entire bandwidth, the whole breadth and depth of it. At the other extreme, it's going to start sounding crazy. I've, I've heard from so many people that have instantaneously been teleported to safety when they've been in an accident, when their car is about to crash. They don't know what happened, but somehow they got thrown clear of the vehicle. It's as if they went right through it. Or maybe um, the, the oncoming vehicle never hit their car, but now is on the other side. And there never was an impact, never was a collision. This is basically quantum tunneling, and it's happening with a Mack truck and a car. You know, vehicles that weigh thousands and thousands of kilograms. It is extremely heavy, and so there's no way to explain that. And these things happen a lot. There are lots and lots of examples of that, as well as instantaneous healing of everything from broken bones, which are not supposed to heal instantly, to cancer going away. 
when we look at what the healers are doing, they're able to enter a dream with their client or with the person. When I say dream, that's recognizing that all of reality is like a dream. And this is what you hear if you study the Upanishads and some Indian writing. They'll tell you reality is a dream. So when you enter the dream with someone, then you share that. And you can enter the dream and help the person find that, that dream reality where they are healthy. And that is that is exactly what healers are able to do, is to go there with someone. And then when they come back on that journey, and it might be with drumming or it might be with chanting. These are what indigenous peoples the world over have used as a, these are ancient technologies uh, that are very effective at implementing quantum jumps. I think the reason most people don't think that these things are happening or don't think they're observing them is primarily because they don't believe it's possible. That's the first thing. And secondly, um, there's an open-mindedness issue because when, once you believe, well, it's possible, then you need to even be even more open-minded so that those kind of experiences could happen. You wouldn't think it would make a difference, but it really does because our, our brains and our minds are set up to observe what we train ourselves to look for. And if we're not looking for these kinds of quantum jumps, reality shifts, Mandela effects, then we don't really notice them. Or we assume, first of all, that we've made a mistake. We think, well, maybe I'm misremembering that. Uh, maybe there's some reason that when I talk about my childhood with my family, they tell a story that I know didn't happen, and they, they seem so convinced it did. We just dismiss those signs and those pieces of evidence that would suggest that we're all experiencing alternate histories, and that it's quite normal. So when, when people assume that we're just going through, like watching a movie on the screen, and you, we want the illusion that that movie is flowing evenly, and it's just as good as real life. Actually, we're watching frames in a movie flashing, so it's a lot more like uh, stair steps, like taking step by step by step by step. I believe that's also what nature is doing. And so we'll be able to start seeing more evidence of it by recognizing that this can and does happen. And we're seeing things that I would expect to find, such as when scientists have a bias to, to begin with, to expect a certain result, that's the result they tend to get. So, uh, some of our Nobel winning scientists are noticing that too. They, they tend to think that there's um, some sort of observer bias, um, but I'm considering it's a deeper problem that actually we can change results just by expecting something different, and we can do that on any scale. I like people who are skeptical about this because I, I think that's good to be skeptical, to be a good skeptic and open-minded, but questioning, like, okay, this doesn't make any sense. This is not what I learned. So how can this possibly be true? And for them, I would suggest looking at placebo studies. Placebo is a word that means I shall please. And in World War II, there were doctors in England that were running out of medication, and so they would basically give the soldiers who were in a great deal of pain um, an injection with just water and some salt in it. So it's just a saline solution. And they would notice in large numbers of people, they would feel better. The doctors wanted to do something. When they run out of medicine on the front line, that's a terrible feeling. So this is why, if you're wondering, well, that sounds unethical. Why would doctors do that? That's why. And right now, in surveys that are conducted across all of the hospitals in America, a majority of doctors absolutely will prescribe placebos for their patients because sometimes they don't have anything that they know for sure will work. And so they, they say, well, take this. We think it will help. And the very fact that that's happening, that there's this placebo effect, which benefits some like 20 to 30 percent of the people that take it, and in fact, that number is going up. It's been increasing. So when you look at the placebo effect, and it's not just sugar pills and salt solution injections, it's also placebo surgery. And just sometimes instruction given from a person to someone taking a test, you've got this, you're gonna do great. The test score will go up 30%. So we're typically seeing about a 30% improvement. And then of people like myself who have faith in the placebo effect, or faith in a greater power, then you can get results up to 70%. 70%. And that is so much more than pretty much any other pharmaceutical 
can claim. That's what I invite skeptics to look at and study. Take a look at what Harvard is doing with their placebo research center. Because skeptics often want to know, where can I go to look at a university or someone I can trust to see what kind of results they're getting? Someone who's doing real studies, they're not falsifying results, they're using a, a gold standard or a platinum standard with with regard to um, double-blind studies, and that would be Harvard and other universities doing similar work. Each of us is um, basically the center of our universe, and we do come together so we can feel the consciousness of others with us, but we're capable of actually experiencing almost anything that we totally believe in. And if people doubt this and they say, well, that can't be right because otherwise I would have won the lottery and so on and so forth, that gets into the energy body again and the fact that we're not totally in our brains as much as people wish they were. Uh, we think with our hearts, we think with our guts, and when you bring this whole thing together, then you'll start noticing you've got subconscious beliefs and you've got subconscious thoughts that may be much more powerful than anything you think that you want. So when you're choosing a reality that you want to go into, then you're you're acting as if. This is something that our American psychologist William James talked about and you can absolutely program it like a GPS, exactly. Just knowing that if, if I was successful then I would need to have this done, I would need to be saying this, I would need to wear this and have these friends and do these things. And so if you start doing all of that then you can definitely start moving into that reality. We can have very confusing beliefs about something, such as money. And I wrote a book about that, High Energy Money, so to help people understand what those kind of thoughts might be that could be tripping them up so they could take a look at the thought and then reverse it. Usually if you've got something that's holding you back, like money is evil, you might as well believe the opposite of that because it's just a random belief. It doesn't mean it's true to just believe, like, ah, oh, money is evil. So you can flip that one around and say money helps us do good things in the world. Money can be the key to um, sharing energy with others. So it's a way of setting yourself free from judging things in ways that are more representative of our own shadow side than what's really so-called out there. This is a good question. How does consciousness relate to the material world? Well, what I've noticed is that consciousness um, seems to be uh, preeminent. It's the, it's the dominant thing. It's always there. And at least that's my observation because I am consciousness. So that's my human experience. I don't know what it's like to not be conscious. But we, and it's one of those things, how do you define consciousness? That's important to know what the description of it is before you start looking at how does it interact with matter. And the truth is, that's still an open question. So even the experts in the field of consciousness are arguing about what exactly is it, which is not where physicists wanted to go. They were hoping that physics could be something that's completely measurable. The idea of consciousness is not measurable. And there's no way to predict the presence, absence, or change in consciousness in any given experiment. Yet now with the observer, consciousness has entered the picture. Consciousness is more than the neurons, so when we try to do the neuron mapping like they're doing and they can map the brain and the networks and then supposedly we should know everything, but we don't. It's, it's more like seeing that you can see the roads but you don't know the traffic patterns and you don't understand why things are happening the way they do. And memories are not stored in a place. It's not like, oh, there's the neuron that stored that memory. They move around. So when we look at the way the brain functions, it's, it's very disappointing in terms of finding a, a way to lock consciousness into the matter That's, that has not succeeded. The reason science cannot prove that consciousness is produced by the brain is what we don't know how to measure consciousness. And science can only handle what it can predict. It can only which means you have to be able to measure something, you have to be able to tell if it's there, if it's changing, if it's gone. And if you can't do that, we still can't do that with consciousness. We rely entirely upon asking someone, do you feel conscious? And we can look at things like, are they, are they awake? Or are they asleep? That kind of thing. We can look at brainwave states. We can measure some things, but it doesn't really get to the heart of the, the issue. That's not surprising to people who have been meditating for centuries, like the Tibetan Buddhists. They understand consciousness 
at a different level because they're going into it through meditation and direct experience. So I think, I think that's more the right way to explore this. What I'm noticing about material world and consciousness is that um, to the degree that we believe the material world is real, this is really important. We buy into that. We start thinking like, okay, this is real. Gravity works. My, my world is the way I think it is, and my assumptions are true. We're social animals, so we collectively share consciousness. And this is a big idea, too. How is consciousness something that sometimes we feel that we have a collaborative feeling? Where does this feeling of all of these emotions, like love and these feelings of uh, forgiveness that we have or gratitude, these are very powerful emotions. So when we combine our consciousness with our family, our friends, our colleagues, and we don't want to go too far away from what we know everybody would agree with, um, then we're kind of anchored down to a certain level of what's possible. We can let go of that when we're in a life or death situation, or when we just want to explore consciousness through something like lucid dreaming or meditation. Then and only then can you actually make that big jump to something else. What's really happening is you're stepping outside of the situation. So it's what always happens when you do a quantum jump is recognizing that you are consciousness. What we tend to do is get stuck in believing we're in a situation. Like we have a problem. That person won't let us do something or something bad happened. And we think we're in this little world. And to make a quantum jump, we need to step back. You need to recognize that you are consciousness and that you're observing all this. You have feelings, you have thoughts, but you're not your thoughts and you're not your feelings. So it's becoming mindful and then becoming energized. And then the third step is exactly that. It's just choose where you want to go next and accept that as the dream that you wish to live. That's, that's the dream you want to come true. So the most important thing to do when you are going on the path, this journey of reality shifting and quantum jumping, I believe, is to become more spiritual, actually, <laughs> to become a better person. It's absolutely important to do that, to be more kind, because what happens if you don't do that is you're disregarding some of yourself, and it's going to pull you off course absolutely every time. So um, even if you're selfish and you think, I just want good, I want a good life, I want a good material world, I don't care about spirituality, you can try it that way. I mean, I don't recommend anybody try it that way because things tend to go, I believe, and I've seen things go wrong because what happens is that those parts of ourselves that are subconscious, that are maybe greedy um, and so forth, if you haven't come to a place of acceptance and forgiveness for yourself and others, you'll be... Uh, going through the same cycles of events, and they're usually not good. So it's, you need to clean things up. One way, to, as we were talking about how to make that quantum jump, is to step back. And one way to instantly step back is to feel an emotion such as gratitude. Because instantly then we, um, you can feel it when you're feeling true gratitude. It's, it's just this amazing experience for me. It, it just feels like my, I can feel my energy expanding. I feel more at peace. Uh, the things that had been troubling me seem like they're not so important. There's a tremendous change that occurs energetically, as well as with the focus of my attention, which goes from, you know, usually being humans, we're looking at what's wrong, what's not going right, what's the thing that's a little bit off right now. We tend to focus on that. But instead, by bringing your attention back to what's really good, what are the blessings, what are the things that mean the most to us that we're grateful for, then we get this boost of energy and also boost of, of the focus. It definitely brings us back on track. And forgiveness does this too. It, some, some people have trouble with forgiveness, but if you can do it, that's a good one. Forgive yourself and forgive others. Forgiveness can be easier when you recognize, like in A Course of Miracles, that there's nothing to it, that everybody is already a pure being of consciousness and a pure being of light and love and that's who we really are and we tend to forget that so sometimes people have trouble really feeling like really that that seems that can be a stretch for some people to to go that far but if you can do it it's wonderful because the benefit is phenomenal <laughs> because what happens when we don't forgive we don't notice that we're getting pulled down with these negative feelings of something went wrong, and if only that hadn't happened, if only they didn't do that. But when you let go of it, it's, it's also very expansive to go into forgiveness and gratitude and love. Those are very powerful. 
One thing we can do is putting yourself back into the center of the story because sometimes we get caught thinking we're a victim or we think something has happened to us. And the way to break free of that, it's basically a drama triangle because then you, it's, it's just playing games and pretending that you're wearing the role of victim and someone else is the villain and there might be a rescuer. But when you realize that doesn't make any sense, I'm going to retrain my subconscious that I can do whatever I want to do. I can be the hero in my own story, but not the kind of hero where I'm fighting evil. Um, just recognizing that I can bring about changes that I want to see in the world. I can be that change in the world. And when, when you really feel like you're doing what you love, then you can come fully alive. And you'll find people that are excited to be with you doing that too. This idea of shifting the earth with um, shared intent, with shared consciousness, and the reason I keep calling it dreaming is because when we think intention, we tend to stay in our heads. When we dream, we dream with our fullness of being. And then we, in our dreams, we can take action, which we can then feel which and give voice to, and then we can think. And so that's the way to bring about the, the biggest changes that we need to make. And so sharing a dream is actually the way to transform the world and sharing a positive dream looking at how good things can get which is a question that i like to leave open-ended so we don't assume that we know what it is and that way you know that good can can prevail that good will will be there and it matches the fact that we live in such a fine-tuned universe right now which is ridiculously unlikely so some people say this is proof that god exists and I tend to think so too. I also think that we can definitely see evidence in that, that we're already winning against whatever may seem like it's impossible or unsolvable or too difficult or too evil. The idea that what resists persists is, is really central to this idea of dreaming a new reality. If you're fighting something, it seems like it gets stronger or it hangs on. In America, we have a war on drugs that never seems to end. We have so many wars, so many conflicts, and it seems like every time we look around, there's a new enemy. Um, but that's not really the way to move forward in a positive manner. The way to move forward positively is to find what you are grateful for, what you love, and to bring more of that into being. So it's very obvious, but it's something that uh, I think we're learning, and this is part of that global awakening right now. I believe we do have free will, but then this comes back to that question of consciousness and who am I, which is like the ultimate question. <laughs> so on some levels, there's, if I factor in the infinite, eternal part of myself that was here before I was born, that will be here after I die, then that part of me has an awareness of what's going on that to me in my day-to-day -day life might feel like I'm living a, a path of fate or something like things are meant to be a certain way. But we definitely do experience free will every time we can make a choice and choose, like all of these realities exist, let's try that one and we can give it a try. And when it comes to neuroscience, what scientists are noticing strangely is gets back to that question of time because we're noticing sometimes um, that we've made a decision before we've even felt the input from, to our senses, which seems impossible. But as far as my own experience, I, I feel like we do have free will and that it matters. I think that's the most important thing right now for us as humans to deal with all the problems on the planet and to help each other is to recognize the level of expansiveness that we can attain and the, the way that we can play with these different realities and also share consciousness. As we were talking about healing someone else and sharing a dream, we can pull each other up by sharing positive dreams with one another. And that can be extremely empowering and can pull us out of things that look impossible. We don't live in a linear timeline at all. I think that is one of the biggest things for people to realize is that you're able to see what you might call a miracle in a moment. You know, anything could happen. And to recognize that there's always a possibility for phenomenal transformation. And people who have been aware of this, and even if you're skeptical, you can still get this to work. So next time you're in a difficult situation, maybe the car is out of gas, or you're stranded, or you have no money, or you lost your purse, whatever happened, some sort of bad news, just take a moment, relax, meditate, center yourself, breathe, 
And then just imagine, well, how good could this get? And imagine, it, just like it's a dream, like you're going into that daydream and you're going to walk into that reality. And so many people have had phenomenal success with it, doing exactly that. And, and I share stories about this in, in my book, Quantum Jumps, because <laughs> it happens to so many people. And even if you're skeptical, even if you think, well, that's ridiculous. How could this possibly work? This is impossible. The car's out of gas, my wallet's gone, whatever. You know, they've told me no, they said they lost my order, whatever happened. But if you just imagine, well, what if there's just some chance that maybe things are okay? Just a slim chance somehow. Just believe in it, dream it. And the dreaming is so important, again, because you're, you're activating the fullness of your being. The, the trouble that some people have with intention is they're just thinking with their heads, and that doesn't work. So you have to really get a full embodiment of it, of, of all of you. People who feel like they're absolutely stuck, that they are perfect proof of this process in action. That's true. And it's true for all of us. You know, anybody who is a human right now, and that's me too. You know, nobody's perfect. We all get to some point where we believe, like, well, this is, this is too much or this is too difficult. But I, at least I know on some level that that's not really true. It's just that I've grown up in a society, on a world, on a planet, where that's been the prevailing belief so far. But I believe that that's changing right now, and more and more people are waking up.